Japanese word yoin means the reverberation or sound of a bell after it has been struck. It's often associated with art and it implies residual effects of an event or object which can transcend a moment in time and space. So I'm using that as my theme to look at um, Takashi Murakami at Versailles. In September 2010, 22 works by the Japanese contemporary artist Takashi Murakami were installed in the palace rooms and gardens at the Chateau de Versailles. Even before the exhibition opened, the controversial nature of promoting contemporary art at a site of such sig national significance was being voiced in, tra in traditional media as well as the Web2 platforms. With some precedents in modern cultural history, the enraged crowd of locals, tourists, and nationals who protested at the palace gates were reminiscent of the revolution. Only it was not Louis XVI's head they wanted. In some strange twist, the action was led by a descendant of Louis XIV, the Prince Henri de Bourbon Palme, seeking a court order on the grounds that the exhibition was degrading and disrespectful. To a lesser degree, two years earlier, an installation of 17 works by Jeff Koons had caused similar controversy. The exhibition was the initiative of Jean-Jacques Agnon, president of the Chateau, supported by Laurent Lebon, curator at the National Museum of Modern Art at the Centre Pomp Pompidou. Alignon called this populist attention, which increased visitor numbers by 20%, the Murakami effect. He continued, even if not all people come for Murakami, it creates an effect of curiosity, and, the cult and culture is curiosity. As a curator, the intervention raises for me several interesting museological issues. The challenges of current strategies to make national cultural sites relevant to contemporary audiences. The curatorial considerations of audience responses to an artist's intent where that intent impacts on the environs and vice versa. The imperative of curators to effectively communicate to their audience innovative juxtapositions of aesthetics and ideas. These issues are too complex to unravel here. Murakami, however, goes some way in justifying this collision of sight, aesthetics and iconography best exemplified in the golden oval Buddha rising from the water pater. Of the reigning courts at Versailles during the 18th century, Murakami acknowledges his connections with Louis XIV when he states, tracking the arc of Versailles, we can see simultaneously the trajectory of art's public reception. In the Sun King's time, Versailles served as a trendsetter, a tool used to communicate the newest ideas and aesthetic innovations. Over the centuries, this status as an exemplar of high culture, oscillated with periods of decadence and isolation from the populace. Murakami was aware of his responsibility as an artist to be accountable, to make relevant his craft to a diverse global public that visit the chateau. In response to the criticism, Murakami said, none of this surprised me, and in the end, I've come to the view it is very part and parcel of the role of which art and artists now play in society. Rapid technolo technological development in the post-war era has meant we no longer are content to be passive observers. The pleasure centers of our evolved brains demand interaction, control, newer and more direct stimuli. In this landscape, art is an, in a unique position to satisfy these needs. I am confident that it will recover its former glory, not only as an object of observance, but as an event. Although Murakami's installations cannot be considered interactive in line with media technologies, his reference to a contemporary demand for a neural stimuli is pertinent. As an artist emerging from the milieu of the 1990s Japanese subculture of otaku, which means socially insular gamers, Murakami's aesthetic reflects the hyperreal characters that inhabit a virtual matrix. Like the courtiers of Versailles, they belong to a universe set apart from reality existing in a world within a world. Aware of how game designers refer to classical principles of perspective, form and value, Murakami's sculptures operated in tension, that is, oscillating between dissonance and harmony with the historical surrounds. For example, in the Salon de Cure, the seven-metre-high tower of Tangari-kun, or Mr. Pointy, 
also known as Mr. Pointy, made vital, literally animated, a space devoid of its historical inhabitants. It is a benevolent and powerful figure with a thousand arms, seated on a frog inside a lotus dotted with ubiquitous eyes, one of Murakami's signature motifs. This derivative work assimilates 800 years of Mayan and Tibetan Buddhist iconography to consider the positive effect of suffering in the world. One could argue the sculpture intensifies the audience engagement with Francois Lemoine's Apotheosis of, of Hercules on Mount Olympus painted overhead, encouraging both a prolonged consideration of Louis XV's decorative program and the room's use for occasions of global diplomacy. Similarly, Murakami's positioning of the oval Buddha Silva in the rooms of the king's apartments invigorated a cultural dialogue between East and West, present and past. The work's sterling silver surface radiates like a prized possession in what was Louis XIV's treasure house, the Chamber of Wealth. On one side of the sculpture is the face of the emperor, also known as the artist, and on the other side of the Janus head is a caricature of the enlightened royal-born Buddha. With an exuberant shark tooth smile and inflated head, Buddha is seated in a meditative pose on a lotus pedestal. In keeping with the traditions of Eastern art, this throne sits on the back of an elephant to indicate endurance. Supported by the interior decoration, Buddha floats against the clear blue of the heavens painted overhead by René Antoine Huas. Murakami has fused the artist, the king, and the Buddha into an omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing, being seated at the center of the universe. While this interior epitomizes the opulence and power of the Baroque, Murakami's sculpture embodies a turn of the millennium capriciousness, what I would like to consider to be called neo-rococo. Like its elusive precursor, Nia Rococo is suggested in a palette or a design. It's express, it expresses consumption to an excess and it imbues the essence of a cultural zeitgeist. Termed goût moderne or genre pittoresque, the style was associated with the court of Louis XV and more specifically with Madame de Pompadour and then the early reign of Louis XVI. The works of Jean-Antoine Watteau encapsulate the dream of princely happiness essential to the, to the Rococo world. Remy Sasselin says, in Watteau's Fête Galante, there was a, na a nature simple and beautiful, tranquil, appeased passions, and love called tenderness. The Rococo renounced the formality and political seriousness of the Baroque in favor of decorative curvilinear forms, delightful and dazzling surfaces, and allegory with hints of capriciousness. For Abbe Gounod, the Rococo was epitomized by Francois Boucher's The Enjoyable Lesson, and the delicate features of the shepherd not in keeping with the expectations of a contemporary male. Denis Diderot describes Boucher's work as appealing to feminine tastes in its brilliance, ostentatiousness, coquetry, and sexual explicitness. Further, he states the Rococo is like the tendrils of its own artificial vines, spread from the interior design to architecture to painting. The style, therefore, was conceptualized as an immersive experience, a harmonious design reiterated in every aspect of the ornamentation and space. Melissa Hyde states, as an academically trained artist, thoroughly versed in academic pictorial codes and modalities, Boucher was superbly adept at deploying and redeploying them, often for ends that coincide with cultural values and preoccupations of the popular um, and mundane culture rather than those of art and the greater public good. Murakami shares much in common with Boucher. With a doctorate from Japan's prestigious Tokyo University of Arts, his creativity reaches deeply into the art historical traditions of both West and East to successfully generate a diversity of meanings. In parallel to Boucher's renunciation of power in preference for the pastoral, Murakami chose to elevate the consumption of the everyday to the status of cultural elite. Noted as a cultural entrepreneur and a critical observer of contemporary Japanese society, Murakami has been criticized for embedding his creative production to the point of, of superficiality within global consumerism. 
In particular, the exuberance and super flatness of Murakami's neo rococo uphold the ideals of allegory, desire, ornament, and coquettishness to reflect a contemporary femininity and the marketing that promotes it. Adrian Favell says, Murakami's role in the cool Japan phenomena is particularly symbolic because of the way his art deliberately packages and sells the street and pop culture of the post-bubble 1990s Japan, a strategy that took him to the very top of the recent global art boom. Where Boucher reappropriated figures from the opera comique, Murakami has lifted from the mise-en-scene of manga, manga and anime, that is, cartoons and animations. In his depictions of the bucolic, Boucher resisted the dichotomy of the sexes. Murakami resists the dichotomy of fact and fantasy, depicting creatures and infantile figures that are both precocious and naive. The Rose of Versailles stands argue arguably as the most popular of the young girls' manga in Japan. Focusing on the court of Marie Antoinette, it captured the sensibility of the Rococo aesthetic as well as androgynous sexuality. Created by Ryobo Ikida, it was first published in 1972 and then in 1979 became the basis of a TV series, followed by a featured animated film in 1990. Modelled on Japan's popular culture merchandising and epitomising the taste of adolescent girls, Saki is one of the entourage of character, caricatures in the series of Jellyfish Eyes. Positioned in Versailles' Salon de Mars, mounted on an elaborate globe strewn with flowers, Saki is the embody embodiment of kawaii, or cuteness. The exaggerated childlike figure with oversized head and suggestive facial features is fashioned in smooth, solid, and brilliant colors. In the Salon de Diane, Diane's chamber, is a self-portrait of the artist with his dog entitled Pom and Me. The walls of this room are flanked with paintings of Alexander, Jason of the Argonauts, and Julius Caesar. There are several busts in the room, including the marble bust of Louis XIV by um, Bernini, which has already been discussed. On the ceiling above is Louis Gabriel Blachard's depiction of Diana, the goddess of the hunt and navigation, accompanied by her dogs. With hand held high, Murakami's precocious alter ego hails the great heroes in recognition of their global conquests. A comment on the power of propaganda, The Emperor's New Clothes, is another self-portrait which stands amidst the paintings of Napoleon in the Coronation Room. Of course, I could talk a lot about all of these, but we don't really have time, so I'm just giving you a brief overview. Murakami makes significant reference to early Japanese courts in the Salon de Venus. Here, Murakami's spiritual guardians, Kaikai Kai and Kiki, this is Kaikai Kai on the left and Kiki in the back. Brandish lances flank a statue of Louis XIV. Kaikai Kai and Kiki echo the bizarre and grotesque style of 16th century Japanese court of the Ashikaga shogunate. Like the lions by Kano Etoku um, panel paintings, Murakami has conjured an entourage of assertive, scary, cute characters. You can see um, some of the the Karajishi are the um, lion type faces with the, you know, gnashing teeth. The treatment of Mr. Dobb in 727 mimics the later 17th century Rimpa style of Ogata Korin and embodies Murakami's ideal of the super flat. Korin is more widely known for his gold leaf panels of irises and plum blossoms traces of which we can, we can see in the contemporary panels of Kawaii Vacances, where Murakami's field of flowers threatens to obliterate the order of the king's guard. Corinne painted rough waves around about the time of Boucher's birth. This flat graphic style where perspective is implied through the horizontal layering of the waves is the basis for much of Murakami's work, yet there is dynamism in this design enhanced in the folding of the screen and the ink wash on gold leaf that emphasises the arabesque line. So these are not meant to be seen flat, the actual angling of the panels is supposed to give you the sense of depth of field as well. The artist's allegorical exploration of the consumerism and sexual fetishism 
prevalent in post-war Japanese culture is exemplified in two iconic works, the highly sexualized Hiropon and the companion hero, My Lonesome Cowboy. To accommodate the high visitation of students to Versailles, neither were exhibited. Murakami says that these works, my erotic pieces are very few. My main theme is the social monster, and sometimes the social monster has an erotic appearance. It is notable that aside from Murakami's use of a Rococo palette, the bodily fluids that lasso my lonesome cowboy echo the wafting ribbons of cloth in the sky above the sensuous nudes of Boucher's triumph triumphal Venus. Murakami's Yumi Lion was designed as a mascot for the, 12, the, for the television company Tokyo MX and its multicolored original embodied diversity, dreams, and peace, Yumi means dream. Exhibited in the Apollia, uh, Salon of Apollo, of, oh, sorry, the Salon of Apollo, the Roman god of knowledge and fine arts and associated with the sun, at the heart of the apartment, the king's apartment, it radiates male potency. The salon was designed as the king's bedroom for, before becoming the throne room, consecutively seats of domestic and public power. Within this sumptuous chamber, Murakami's king of the animals has replaced the throne dais that usually sits adjacent to the um, portrait of the sun king by Rigaud, which um, we see in the exhibition. Analogous symbols reverberate between Murakami's dream lion and the room's paintings. The nearby gilt pedestal tables and the golden andirons and the fire Obliquely, Murakami comments on royal patronage and the dialogue between art and power. What often appears to be simply decorative is subsumed and inseparable from the ego of the monarch. Opulence, allegory, and bedazzlement all belong to the princely dream of happiness. The controversy Murakami drew in the media had a tangible effect on audience visitation to Versailles. Importantly, in the cultural sector, it opened debate on the benefits and drawbacks of, a contemporary, art, of contemporary art activating heritage sites. From another perspective, individual works paired with selected lo locations in the chateau offered opportunities for the artist to challenge ideas of cultural hegemony and the presumed isolation of creative modes. Together, the environs and the objects conflated the global reach of the artist with the Buddha and the French Regency. That is, through his self-portraits and caricatures, the artist positioned himself as an omnipotent, all-knowing and all-seeing, seated at the centre of this particular universe. In effect, Murakami collapsed time and space, bringing together the cultures of Japan and France, the iconography of the East and the West, and the aesthetic modes from different centuries. Murakami at Versailles may have incited a revolution among the populace, but his indulgent and playful art has entwined with ten was entwined with tendrils from the past. Thank you.